Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the Hockey Think Tank podcast brought to you by the HockeyThinkTank.com, a website for all players, parents, and coaches to go to get a little bit of education and a little bit of inspiration regarding the greatest game on the planet. What an episode we have for you guys here today. An unbelievably inspiring episode with one of my great buddies in the game, Nolan Graham. Nolan grew up on Vancouver Island out in Western Canada, BC. He played his college hockey at RPI, RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, Then he went on to coach junior hockey before going on to be an assistant coach at RPI, his alma mater for a lot of years before uh, a tragic setback ha- happened to him um, involving a car. And we get into that in the podcast. And uh, man, this is just one of, one of the best guys in the game. One of the best guys in the game. Such a well-liked guy in college hockey circles and beyond. And it was so, so awesome to get Nolan on the podcast to talk about his journey uh, to talk about uh, where he's at right now from his traumatic brain injury. And this is honestly one of my favorite episodes that we've done. So inspiring, such an amazing human being. And uh, can't wait over to can't wait to get over to Nolan. But before we do get over to him, let's bring on the talent of the podcast, the one Jehu Jeffrey Lavecchio. Vex, what's going on today? I'm having a great day. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, number Deep one. Down. As we're recording this, the Bruins and the Maple Leafs game just finished as I'm checking my phone here. And the Bruins lost, which, boof. But their only goal was scored by Trent Frederick. And Joseph Wall played for the Maple Leafs and was first star of the game and saved, you know, put put them uh, in the driver's seat to get another game in this series and see where it goes. So, I couldn't be more happier. My phone is absolutely blowing up right now asking if I saw the game and, and what Wally did and Freddie scoring and stuff. So for me, just uh, uh, nothing cooler than seeing that. Very cool, man. You're also, and Patrick Maroon got the assist on it. Patrick Maroon got the assist. Somebody sent me the box score and it literally says Trent Frederick, Patrick Maroon, Joseph Wall scored on. And I was like, wow, that's wild. Three St. Louis guys, two of them I trained out a big deal. Um, <laughs> also... Man, I don't know. Maybe we get into this for for short shifts, but uh, my tweet heard around the hockey world yesterday, especially the St. Louis hockey world. Oh, my God, bro. All right, so we got to go through this. Like, yeah. Dude, we had a bunch of kids leave. uh, 16 kids over three age groups leave St. Louis to go play. Might have been four. Might have been four. I don't know. I don't know what the exact number is. It's a lot. It's a lot, man. Years, whatever. Yeah, and uh, like, like the, literally leaving St. Louis to go to other states, other other places, academies, other states, whatever. Yeah, play, whatever, yeah, wherever the hell they're going, and like eight or nine of them are on one team, and like most of our teams this year were, you know, I don't care about rankings, but this is what they tell me. Oh, but most of our teams were top fifteen in the in the nation and stuff. And I'm like, but why are all these guys leaving? And I don't think it's just a St. Louis problem or just a, you know, organization problem. Obviously I've been getting messages and tweets and DMS and calls and texts and emails and pages nonstop for the last freaking I don't know, 30 hours about, you know, all these different cities talking about it and, and losing players. And I just look at it like, man, something's like, come on. Like some of these kids are 13, 12. I had somebody text me during the podcast, two nine-year-olds are, yeah. are, are leaving. And I'm like, dude, keep your kids at home, mom and dad. Like, you know, what's the most important thing here? And also St. Louis has an unbelievable amount of resources here. We have so many retired NHL players that are coaching that are good coaches. We have so many guys who played college, so many guys who didn't play at all who are great coaches. Obviously I'm here for training, (laughs) you know, there's skills coaches, skating coaches that, that work with the highest level of players. We have everything you need here to develop. And for people to think that they need to leave really kills me, really kills me, you know, like, oh, I just get gutted. And so I talked about that on Twitter and, you know, nonstop firestorm ensued that 90, 99% positive people. Like, I'm so glad that that we're talking about this here. Um, 1% not positive. And and either way, I don't care. I mean, I, I just want kids to stay in St. Louis and I want 
St. Louis to be able to do the things that make kids stay here and then do that in other states as well for all kids to be able to grow up at home as long as they can uh, um, and not be lured. And, you know, the, one of the biggest things that I've been talking to people about is that it's driven by a lot of these shysty, shady agents, quote unquote, air quotes, advisors who are like, you got to go and play for X or Y to get scouted. Nobody's scouting in the Midwest. And I'm like, who? come on. You idiots. That's not a thing. Chicago's in the Midwest. St. Louis is in the Midwest. Like what? You, Detroit's pretty close to the Midwest. I don't know if that counts as Midwest yeah, or not. Midwest. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? Nobody gets scouted in the Midwest. Mom and dads, please don't believe this. Don't believe this. If you're good, your player is being seen and will be seen from 12 through midget major when they're trying to get to juniors. Not 12. Not 12. Yeah, whatever. Shouldn't 13. be anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I know. But I'm saying wherever they're playing, there's people watching who matter and are texting other people in the hockey world saying, hey, have you heard about so-and-so? Have you heard about so-and-so? You don't need to go play for whoever, you know, who's recruiting, you know, kids and stuff. I do understand that if somebody's giving your son or daughter a scholarship and you, you, you can't afford hockey or that makes sense for your family, I do understand that maybe being an option because hockey is so disgustingly expensive. Other than that, for me, uh, you know, I'm like, man, let's all as a hockey community do better and and find and stop doing this shit, too. You know, I don't yeah, know. it's become normalized, like it's kids moving at 13, 14 years old has become normalized. And I think there's one thing like another way to think like there are people who are doing a good job, right? Like some of these academies are talking like the Shattuck. Oh, the of course. The of the world, the Mounts, Culver's, like St. Andrews. And there's a lot of places up north and stuff, <laughs> you know, but like, man, like what has been normalized is you have to leave home at a young age and you have to pay X amount of dollars for your kid to be seen or to develop or whatever. But like, I, I just keep going back to it. Like, look at Minnesota, look at mm -hmm. Minnesota. Why mm -hmm. do they keep churning out the most elite players? It's because as many as possible for as long as possible. And if we continue to make hockey not fun by making it too serious and too professional at such a young age, then it's not as many as possible for as long as possible. And so, you know, it's, it, there's two sides of it because like, you know, you could probably make an argument that like some of these people recruiting to some of these teams, it's because they care and they, they're going to develop kids and yada, 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 which there's some truth to that. But like, what's the cost? Mm. Like, what's the cost, man? First of all, the cost from like a, you know, a, a, a financial side of things, but also like, what's the cost for your kid moving away from home that early and not learning the life lessons from you as, as their parents? What's Who's the cost? raising your kid? Who's raising your kid? Yeah. What's their way from 14 to 18? You're not raising your kid. Someone yeah. else is. Yeah. And what's the cost for, for you as a parent for like sending your kid away? Like. That, that'd be devastating, man. Like it's, it's wild. Um, and, and so I don't know, like I've always been a big believer in stay at home as long as you can. Don't make a lateral move yeah. to, to, to go away from home. Like if you're playing for a reputable, good program in your hometown, why, why would you leave other than ego? Right. Right. I, what I think of happens is, and what I know happens is, you know, one kid goes who maybe has a great opportunity, goes to NTDP or goes to juniors. Yeah. And then it's a little a earlier. Oh, and now then, we're going to suck and our team's not going to be in the top 10 in the my hockey rankings. And yeah, so exactly. nobody's going to watch our kid and yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Like yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then everybody else after that first kid is lateral move, lateral move, lateral move, lateral move. And it's like, well, if you know, if all of you just stayed except for that one kid, you'd still be nasty. I mean, I had, I had a bunch of kids that I work with and, and train that made it to the semifinals of, uh, of nationals and outshot the team in the semis and then almost won and had a great year. And for li literally two weeks later, they're all a bunch of them are all somewhere else right now for the week or, or four days doing, you know, getting scouted at a tournament. I'm like, the season just ended guys yeah. develop right now. Like what do you, 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 you were just in the semis of nationals. Everyone who matters was watching you. 
you don't need to go to this thing to spend money on this random tournament you know like it's if you're going because you want to have fun and experience okay whatever but if you're going and what everybody tells me is there's gonna be scouts out there dude you just played in the national tournament semifinal everyone watched you when you were playing real hockey no one cares about four weeks later random piecemeal teams put together for something that is just lining somebody's pockets yeah yeah and it's amazing too i'll go a step further like and you know this too, because I've heard you tell me stories about this and I get stories about it too. Like how many people leave for greener pastures on the other side and then immediately regret that decision? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like seriously, like how many families have come to you being like, Oh, I left for, you know, whatever. And then it's like, Oh, I had a good thing here. I didn't really realize it was a good thing until I went out into the world and saw that there are other things out there that might not be as good as what we have here. A hundred percent. Is that crazy? And guys, the sooner you learn this, mom, dad, players, coaches, the grass will be greener wherever you freaking water it. Ooh. For those of you out there, Vex just dropped his mic. And now he's on mute. He messed up. Okay. <laughs> I did drop my mic. You want to get better? Work out more. Eat better, sleep better, listen to coach more, watch more. I think that's all the stuff at home. I think that's honestly like, and and we talked about this with Nolan on, on the podcast is like, if, if, you know, we have these debates about, should you leave? Should you go blah, 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 whatever. It's the wrong debate because at the end of the day, the kids got to want it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Like maybe playing here or there, whatever can help for a little, but like at the end of the day, the kids got to want it. That's the, mo- that's the most important thing, you know? So I'm like, I'll challenge like parent, like may- and maybe going to a different environment will want, make them want it more. Um, maybe it won't, who knows? Like, again, everybody's path is different. Everybody sure. has a different path. Every kid is different physically, mentally, emotionally, maturely, maturely, mm, maturely. Huh? Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, it, these debates, like, it there it's there's so much gray to them you know there's so much gray to them but at the end of of the day like man like just look at minnesota just look at minnesota the community model as many as possible for as long as possible and then again that's not to say that some of these triple a teams or some of these academies aren't doing phenomenal jobs of developing players but just look at the data as many as possible for as long as possible Mm -hmm. our our o3 group here in st louis they were like, I think it was 03. They were really good. I'm three. I think it was 03. And there was one year where like six or seven kids left. And literally almost, there was one or two who really liked their experience. But most of them were kind of like, man, if we all would have stayed, we would have been really good. And I was like, yeah, duh. <laughs> like, why? Like, we, you guys are playing U15 hockey or whatever. where are you going? Like, U16, they would, and they almost, the team that stayed almost won natties and is like dude if you guys all stayed you pretty much would have guaranteed one yeah. national championship like yeah. well, come on come on come on you know? yeah you woke some people up there jeff causing a ruckus on social yeah. media yeah yeah geez, geez, why my voice is all right gone. all right let's get over because this conversation was unreal man like, electric nolan is just the best just an unbelievable guy such a respected guy in the hockey community and uh, before we do get over to nolan though we do have some people to thank first want to thank icehockeysystems.com our title sponsor you guys hear us talk about them every week the best place to go for everything you need coaching education thousands of drills that can help you plan your practices whiteboard explanations that can help you become a better coach from some really high level hockey coaches the ability to draw up your drills send them out to your team before practice print them out put them up on the wall however you want to do it just makes coaching so much easier for everybody and so go to icehockeysystems.com and we have partnered with them on an associations platform where you can get this for every single coach in your association and not just every coach in your association but every parent too because they have access to our hockey think tank parent survival guide that you can disperse amongst all of your parents as well. So go to icehockeysystems.com today and check this out for your association. Vex. Want to thank Trainer Heroic. Train Heroic is the amazing app that allows me to work with so many players around the world, so many teams and so many organizations. Um, if you guys are looking to, you know, up what you offer to all of your players and parents, uh, um, 
I have an unbelievable app, Train Heroic, that allows me to do that. Videos of everything. I offer Zoom calls with every team and organization that signs up with me monthly throughout the season, uh, just here to deliver a better experience, uh, a cheaper experience, and allowing you to train at home, at a gym if you're choosing. You know, you don't have to be with the team. Anybody can do it anywhere if your team has to drive all over. Just so many different reasons that Train Heroic uh, uh, has been amazing in me helping more players train smarter and harder. So thank you to Train Heroic. If you guys are looking for off-season training and you don't have a great coach near you, go to my gmbm.com website, sign up. You will literally be in the best shape of your life if you just follow the training program. I guarantee it. I will even give your money back if you do it how it's supposed to and you call me and I believe you and it's saying that you did and you weren't in the best shape of your life. I'll literally give you your money back. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Cure Nutrition. Cure Nutrition is a CBD company I'm with. Pretty topical with what we're talking about here with Nolan with his uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, CBD is something that I've taken twice a day every single day since 2017. Uh, my last season playing and it definitely helps me recover from training recover from stress keep my brain functioning healthy uh, um, and so many other positive benefits i'm never trying to push anything so if you have questions please reach out i have tons of people that listen to the show that reach out to me all the time so don't be afraid reach out to me ask the who what why when where any of that stuff or go to curednutrition.com use my discount code gmbm Sweet man. Also want to thank NHL Sense Arena. And this is an unbelievable virtual reality training tool that you can use at your home. We all know that ice time is expensive. Skills coaches potentially are expensive. And this is an unbelievable way at home. You can sharpen up your hockey IQ skills. And we talked about it. Like some of the most important things that you can develop is your hockey sense, your hockey IQ. And this is a, a really, really neat way to be able to do that from home virtual reality game. They have over a hundred plus drills for not just players, but goalies as well. Vex and I used this when I was down in St. Louis. It's fun as hell guys. It's like a lot of fun to do. And so I really encourage everybody to head on over to hockey.sensearena.com and pick this up. We also have a discount code with them. It is think tank one word. If you do that, you will get $50 off your annual plan, uh, 50 bucks for annual plan for an unbelievable virtual reality training game. Dude, this is so much fun. It's like you're back in it. It's like, it's like you're back in it. I'm probably going to get yelled at one day for selling too hard with this thing on my head because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so dope. Uh, and lastly, want to thank Helios Hockey. Uh, go to helioshockey.com, an unbelievable product. It is a sensor that you put into your shoulder pads. And with this sensor, it is going to give you real-time feedback on everything from your stride mechanics to what the younger kids call a hustle score. Very, very fun for them to do that. And also, the game changer is what, Jeffrey? The hustle score. No. What's the game changer? The shifts. Oh, my God, dude. Clipping <laughs> the shifts. Clipping the shifts, guys. I would do anything to go back. I needed video. I needed video. Having this thing and you literally, your game's over, your shifts are clipped. You can watch them on your phone, in the car, what, like literally game, set, match. Instantly will get you better. No <laughs> doubt in my mind. I have so many buddies whose kids who bought this for their kids and they are absolutely loving it yeah. because of the show. So, dude, this is, for me, this is a no-brainer. There you go. And so go to heliosaki.com and they will give all Helios new Helios members 20% off uh, their initial 12 month membership by using the coupon code think tank one word. And you're also going to get that sensor to put in your shoulder pads for free. So those are all the people that support us and we want to support them as well. Every single one of these are ones that we've used. Every single one of these are people and products that we believe in. And we just encourage everybody to head on out and, and use them too. We think it'll be for your benefit. And then lastly, want to thank all of you out there, listeners who continue to support what we do. And honestly, like you guys are going to love this conversation. This is one of my favorites that we've ever done. Uh, a very, very dear friend, uh, an awesome, awesome hockey guy. And you guys are, you guys are going to love, you're going to fall in love with Nolan. And if you don't know him, 
Um, if you do know him, you're going to have a great time reconnecting with him, and he's the man. So uh, without further ado, here we go with Nolan Graham. We are so excited to have on this episode of the podcast out in one of my favorite areas in the world, Vancouver Island. We got Nolan Graham. Nolan, how are we doing today, man? We're doing well, Tof. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I know I mentioned an email. I'm very grateful that you reached out and, um, you know, to you and Vex, like, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to, yeah, I guess, chat about hockey. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely, man. One of the best <laughs> hockey guys in the game and, and looking forward to talking some puck. But with all of the guests that we have on here, man, uh, not many people that I know love the game more than you do. And <laughs> so we always start off with the beginning of the journey and how you fell in love with the game. I know your dad is big into hockey. Um, so tell us about how you fell in love with this great game of hockey. <sighs> Well, I think like everybody, it starts as a young kid. I can't recall exactly the age, but uh, just playing minor hockey in Nanaimo um, and going through the ranks. Uh, I guess it would be an Adam Pee Wee Bantam. So, you know, 12 through 13, 14 um, and just loving the game. And I think one of the influential parts I, I, as pre preparing for this, um, my mom was the um, arena secretary, I guess, or she was the ice allocator oh so you had keys to the kingdom hey secrets <laughs> 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 i did but through that she ended up marry, er, marrying marrying <laughs> ended up meeting a great man um, who was coaching the animal clippers i don't know if you know gary davidson oh yeah 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 so gary was coaching the clippers during my mom's uh, time there we ended up being a billet family um for three or four years when i was 13 through maybe 16 um and the two players we ended up hosting um the first one was mark rycroft okay. who played in nanaimo and we still keep in touch he does the abs he's a clown <laughs> he's the greatest <laughs> person but anybody who gets altitude tv can see him intermission stuff it's hilarious and then the second one who i still keep in touch with up until maybe three as recent as three weeks ago um steve korea oh so wow we had yeah we had those two players live with us for four years and i think that helped me not helped me but inspired me to want to follow in their footsteps i mean i think one of the first things i learned about what college hockey was was uh when steve miller came to uh, our house to have an in-home visit with mark rycroft mm -hmm. who ended up going to denver and um yeah, so like I just I've kept in touch with Killer since then, and so that's where my love started. And I think another, yeah, I sorry I'm rambling, but um, so like through that I just wanted to play junior hockey and go to college and follow in their footsteps. And you know, my parents had a backyard of the hockey net, and we played ball hockey every day outside. And it was never nobody ever, you know, I just wanted to do it. It was just automatic, like. It's not like, hey, go do this now. It was just what I wanted to do. I couldn't wait for school to be over and go play ball hockey and shoot pucks and do all that sort of stuff. And that led me to a couple of years in the BCHL in Chilliwack with uh, Harvey Smeal. And then, um, yeah, I was fortunate enough to get an opportunity to go to fulfill my dream of playing college hockey at RPI. That's really cool. And like, so all three of us on this call at some point were like billet brothers and we had I people not. living, living in our houses, playing junior hockey. And like, if you're living in a city that has a junior team, like I would seriously consider doing that being a billet uh, host, because I look at some of the older guys that came through my house, Vex, you too, Nolan, like with your stories that you just talked about, like we talk about mentorship on this podcast all the time and how unbelievably positive that experience could be to have great mentors around us. And when you're a kid that's growing up, maybe you're younger, maybe you're a teenager, whatever, to have somebody living in your house and living the dream of where you aspire to go, especially if it's a good kid, most kids are good kids. There's always a couple that 
cause a little bit of trouble. <laughs> um, but like, it's just so good. So like, what were some, first of all, awesome yep. that you got to see killer in action, like a young oh, yeah. when he was at Denver, one of the best in the business. <laughs> totally. um, like one, uh, what were some of the things that like you kind of took from, you know, Mark Rycroft and Steve Korea, you know, did, did they play ball hockey with you out in the driveway? Were you watching hockey with them? Were you talking hockey with them? Like, what was your experience? Like, having those um, older billet brothers around you? No, great question. I think with, um, with Riker, it was, I was still young enough or we just play hand hockey, like, you know, like with a rolled up sock and just make a net out of couch cushions and amazing. Yeah. Like I think I could be off by a couple of years, but I think I was like 13 then. Um, I don't recall Riker ever playing ball hockey with us, but um just like indoor hand hockey and like he would talk about the games and whatnot. And then, um, you know, with Steve, like I was fortunate enough to know him and he's still, he's still very close and he's the most caring, thoughtful person that I've honestly ever met. Um, he still works for the Islanders as a pro scout and he always calls me to see if I've seen somebody or heard about something. And, but with him, like it was just his work ethic. I mean, there was just, that was his family, you know, and it comes from his mom and dad. I think, well, his dad's passed away. His mom's still alive, but um, they just loved it. Like him, Paul and Marty just eat, breathe, and he'd bring his skates home and, you know, like work on his skates and just, you know, just whatnot. And funny story, actually, we, like, we still joke about this um, to this day. We would always, he was competitive, like super competitive. And as was I, like the biggest thing that I hated was like, okay, maybe I was better than my younger brother at hockey, but I wanted him to try, like just not quit. If he quit, it's like, I don't, I don't want to do that. It's like, just give me your best, you know? And Steve was still the same way. I think I was 16 and we had this thing called the king of all threes. So it was three card games and it was crib, uno, and I think... I want to say war, but if you had all three championships, then you were the king of all threes and just Ooh. like bragging rights. <laughs> but like from him, what I brought up, what I took was just dedication and just like to his craft. Like he, you know, undersized guy. And again, back in those days, Tof, as you know, and me, you know, it was a, it was a grind and it was, you know, especially maybe five years prior to me playing junior, um, just dedicated, you know, and it wasn't something that his parents had to ask him to do, or we had to ask him to do, or he just loved it. You know, he'd bring his sticks home and work on his sticks and just things that you never would have thought about. And, you know, just, just loved the craft. Yeah. That's awesome. Where do you think that comes from? Because like Paul yeah. was the same way. Um, like just, I, I, and I say this in a very endearing, positive way, absolute hockey nerds. Yeah. Um, you know, where do, where do you think that comes from? I'm sure you got to know the family a little bit, you know, yeah. they got the chance to be around you. Like, where do you think that love for the game for that family anyway? And then obviously you love the game too. Where do where do you think that love of the game comes from? Cool. That's a heck of a question, to be honest. Um, I think it's kind of built in you, in my honest opinion, you know, like it, it's not for everybody and that's fine. And that's totally cool. Like, I think I commented on maybe one of your posts about like my daughter just loves gymnastics. Like she just loves it. We never have to force her to go. She never says, I don't want to go or I, it's just, she just loves it. So it's like, okay, if you're in love with it, I think let's continue. And I think, I want to think that the most successful people in any sport or in any profession just love it. You know, they just, what, I don't know what the recipe is for that, but it's not like they've been asked to do a chore, which is shooting pucks, or it's not like they've been asked to do a chore, which is, you know, working out, or it's just, they just, they want to get better. They just want to be the best that they can do, the best that they can be at the, you know, the activity that, 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 that they choose. So, so let me ask you this as a coach, or did you have any coaches either, or is there a way to fan that flame? Is there a way to get players 
to understand, you know, if you want to make, you love this game, you say you do, if you want to make to the next, next level, there are going to be some certain things that you've got to work at, like shooting pucks and things like that. Because I personally seen guys who maybe were like toe in and the right people are, you know, helping them through, hey, if this is something you want, you know, as yeah. a mentor, and then just all of a sudden, and now they're boom, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a complex one. I mean, um, for me as a coach, um, my dad was that. And I'll, I'll give you a funny story about my dad. So my dad coached me for two years. Or sorry, one year. Um, he coached Bantam AAA here in Nanaimo. In my very first year, so I guess I would have been 15, he cut me from the AAA team. Whoa. And yeah. The, okay. Oh, there you go. So Sorry, I just got we, we got to dive deeper. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, I mean all my friends know this and like I was all my best buddies that played played Peewee Triple-A were on the Triple-A Bantam team. And my dad told me that I need to play Bantam B to get more touches and to you know get more playing time essentially. Um and my mom had nothing of it. She was livid. <laughs> but it ended up being like one of the greatest seasons that I had. I got to touch the puck. I think I was the leading scorer and then played Bantam AAA, Midget AAA, and, you know, the rest was you know, on to college. But um, so probably my dad. Um, but as far as like, how do you foster that? I've done a lot of reflecting over the past six years after being out of the game it feels like a lifetime um but i think it's just honest conversations like no ulterior motives as far as a coach or just trying to convince you to do something it's like what do you want out of this like what what is your real goal because if your real goal is like to get better and move on then truth be told like we shouldn't have to ask you to, to to be the first of the rank and be shooting pucks because you can't whatever one time the puck like I, I think like honesty is a very i know everyone says they're honest but i think and the better word maybe is just genuine it's like mm. if you if you really want to get better like we shouldn't that i mean that comes at a certain age as well too you know like maybe 12 13 14 15 is probably not the Kids are still feeling it out and stuff and finding out whether they love it or not. But when you get into the higher, and I've never coached youth hockey younger than junior hockey. Um, so I don't know what those conversations could or maybe should look like at the 13, 14 year old. But, um, you know, at some point when you start to get, you know, really invested in it and want to get something out of it, it's like, here's what's happening in outside of your world. You know, like these are, I don't want to say it's extra things. It's just, if you really want to do it, kind of prove it, you know, like. I also think it's a great teaching moment where instead of, I think a lot of coaches at those ages, whether it's 12 to 16, depending on where they are, what level they're at, who the coach is, all things like that. I think a lot of coaches go from the scare tactic route to like, you have to be shooting pucks. You have to be working out. You have to be watching video or else you're not going to make it. And you don't care. I think that, you know, and something we talk on this and, and part of that is true, but uh, yeah. something we talk about on this podcast all the time is like, why are we doing youth sports for most of youth that do it? It's life lessons hidden in a fun game that they absolutely love doing mentorship, learning, you know, responsibility, all these things that we talk about. And I think that it should be more of like coaches coming and organizations coming from the place of, we want you to, to do this stuff because we want to see you see yourself improve. So you can realize that if you want to be better at something, and you put some time and some effort and take some responsibility, you are going to learn to be better at anything you do the rest of your life. If you want to be better, you put in more effort than the next guy or the next town or the next team. And I think that's where 
coaches and, and parents and organizations need to think zoom out like more like let's get back to like life lessons use hockey as a metaphor and, and so it's coming from kind of a different place where maybe kids will accept that more than the kids who are just like well i just kind of like hockey so i'm not going to do any of this stuff you yeah. know what i mean i think that I would be way i think that would be way more powerful as a for society 100 percent, 100 percent. i totally agree with that like I, I, I mean, I totally told before I get off track and I kind of get a thought in my head and I'm that's to hear you talk about that too. And I still maybe call me a dinosaur, 45 year old, old school, but I like the other sport aspect stuff too. And I'll give you an example of why. And again, self-reflecting over the past six years, um, the game was taken from me, uh, my involvement in the game um, like that, like, it, it was the most bizarre, random thing that has ever happened to me in my life. And to be able to fall back on other sports that I can still go walk around a golf course and, yeah, I can't do this anymore. I, I, I can't play as well anymore because of some of the, 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 the brain stuff. But becoming a well-rounded individual, and I think that comes next to where you're talking about being a positive member of society, you know, like, and again, things change. And I think we need to have a lot of tools in the toolbox, you know, that, that you don't know you're going to need them one day, but through sport, you, and I'll give you another example of that if I can. Um, I, so my whole life, three till I guess I was 39 at the time, 45 now, my new team, <laughs> which I get a lot of, benefits from is I go to the local brain injury society is for people. I know we're jumping the gun here and I know people no, okay, listening that, might yeah. not. Um, it's people that have acquired brain injuries and it's, you know, on varying spectrums of the brain injury thing, but like I can, they're my teammates. I can talk to them about the issues that I have um, that they can relate to that maybe people who don't understand brain injury can't. Um, I mean, maybe that's the team player in me, and that's what I loved. I love being uh, – I lo what I loved about hockey, and this is maybe Tophus is – maybe I feel like it might resonate with you too. And with most successful – I never wanted to let down a teammate, mm -hmm. whether that was blocking a shot or, you know, missing a grade A chance in a tie game. or I just never wanted – I don't want to let down the like brain injury friends by not showing up for a meeting, you know, like I know they enjoy my interaction. I, I appreciate theirs as well too. And, you know, again, just to, to, to the life levels, like or the life lessons, Um, you just never know when you need to going to have to pull something out at some point in your life. Absolutely. You know? And that's why I like, you know, just hearing you talk and, and Vex and I talk about it all the time, like one of the best parts about playing sports and the things that you learn is how to be a part of a team and how to understand when to put your arm around somebody when they need it, how to understand how to kick somebody in the booty when they need it, <laughs> um, you know, and, and just be there for people at the end of the day, because, you know, it's interesting. I was having this conversation with somebody the other day, but like, there's a woman named Jen Baker who used to work at Cornell when I was there. Now she's the AD at Johns Hopkins. And she's like one of the smartest leadership people I've ever met in my entire life. And one of the things she always used to talk about was you're not just a teammate for the three hours that you're at the rink. You're a teammate all 24 hours of the day. And the things that you do together or the positive for the negative, whatever is going to affect everything that goes on at the rink. And, you know, we're all going to be a part of a team at some point in our lives, whether that's our family team, whether that's what you're talking about with, with your brain injury team. You know, I have a team with the hockey think tank here, Vex and I, we're kind of like a team with Steph and like w w life's about people, man. Life's about people. And that's one of the things that like, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I feel like Vex and I this week for whatever reason, with all that St. Louis hockey stuff, we've kind of gotten on a soapbox about all this stuff, but like we need to continue to preach the importance of learning how to be part of a team. It's, it's probably the most important outside of like resilience, maybe like being a part of a team is one of the most important things that we can learn because we're always dealing with people 
all the time. <laughs> and, uh, and it's true. Like what you said there, like, that's one of the things, like when you can do something for people outside of you and like when your motives are for the betterment of not yourself, but the people that you're with, honestly, I don't know if there's anything more rewarding as a person than like doing something for somebody else without the expectation of something coming back in return. Um, and I think when teams get that, like all championship teams, I shouldn't say all, but most championship teams have that. Right. And so it, it's so right. And we need to be talking about that more. And that, that's a great, you know, it's a great story from you because it is like the life lessons that you learn while you're playing. They very much, and you never know when you might need them. Um, you know, they yeah. very much, um, help you to succeed in life after hockey. hundred percent. I mean, uh, there, there, there's, there are things that, um, I mean, there's been some dark times. I'm not going to BS around the whole thing is that there I've been very, I felt isolated, you know, and that's part of this stuff. Um, but, um, and COVID didn't help, <laughs> 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 but, um, there, there's been tough times, you know, like there have been where I, you know, I watch a hockey game and, you know, I watch the, the regionals and I see people that I know and, you know, I know people made fun of us all the time, but me and Benny were college roommates and we always go on the road together and, but see him do well, like, it's like, what could have been, you know, like, and mm. that was always my dream and goal. Like I, I, I've written down a whole bunch of stuff that like, that was my dream job. Like it was my dream job. Did I want to be a head coach? Of course, but like things change like that. And it's just like, it, you know, li life's life. It carries on, you know, like things move on, you know, life's life. Yeah. It's uh wildly unpredictable and, 100%. uh, and, and crazy for sure. Yeah. Well, 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 let's get to that. You talk about your dream yeah. job because both of us got the opportunity to coach at our alma mater. You know, I got the chance to go back and, and coach at Cornell where, where I played, you got the chance to go back and coach at, at RPI where, uh, where you played, you know, what was that experience like for you? I think it, it holds a little bit more, you know, weight, let's call it when, when you get to go back to the alma mater <laughs> and back to the place where that, <laughs> that made us right. Like that's the most formative years of our life that made us yeah. who we are. Um, talk about your experience there being a coach. I mean, first of all, it was a dream come true to be offered a scholarship. So like I was, and maybe Shafe will listen to this, but I still owe Shafe an apology because I never took my official visit when he already booked a flight because I already committed oh. to RPI. <laughs> but um, it was, it was a dream come true. I remember the day that uh, coach Dan Fridgen came and saw me in exhibition and offered me and I, I know exactly what I said to him. It's one of those kind of, I was like, so you're going to pay for my whole school just for me to help you win hockey games. <laughs> and he's like, yep. I'm like, all right, let's go. You know, like, it's just like, it was a dream. It was like, they like told you with the other mentors and whatnot, but um, to go play there was fantastic. I still keep in touch with all those guys, but then to have the opportunity through Seth Appert um, to come back and coach there at, I mean, for so many reasons, it was super special. I mean, my wife, we were married at the time and she got to go see where I went to school and, you know, meet a whole bunch of professors that were still there and see the place that I played hockey and eventually watch games that I was coaching at. And, you know, like it was an easy sell for me when I was recruiting on the, re it was just, I loved it so much and I owe so much of my life to that opportunity that it was just a genuine, honest, like, Hey, here you go. You know, player X, like come join the club. You know, I had an absolute blast there. It's a great place to play. And it was just that from the heart, from my experience an easy sell, you know, like, um, so it was a, it was a very special opportunity that, uh, I owe Seth Appert a lot of, um, thank you for. And, um, it's something that, you know, I'll never forget and, you know, didn't end the way I wanted it to, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it was amazing. It was amazing. And it's still, the memories are, you know, hard to go through because I always have that what if 
Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I loved it. Loved every second of it. Yeah, seeing I, the same, seeing the same fans, the same Zamboni drivers, the same like it was just. It's again, it's a community. The same professors, the same. Yeah, it's just coming back. My grad in '03, so I guess eight years later. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's wild. I I used to tell recruits, you know, when I was at Cornell, I'm like, Hey, the best part of my job was knowing how unbelievable of an experience I had here and getting the opportunity to extend that opportunity to somebody else to have the same or similar experience that I did. Like there was nothing better, nothing better. And you're so right too. like the same Zamboni driver, the same, everybody is the same. When I entered in 2004, as Mm -hmm. it is 20 years later now in, in 2024, uh, which is, which is hilarious. But you know, you mentioned apps and, and so Seth Appert was the head coach at RPI when, when you came back as a coach, um, he's now coaching in Rochester in the American hockey league. And we had apps on early Vex. Like he was probably our first year maybe of even doing this. Yeah, and was. one of the things that he said, Vex and I bring up on the podcast from time to time because it was one of those things where, like, you're like, man, like that's awesome. Like, can I awesome. get? Can I guess what it was? Ooh, yeah. What do you got? Um, be invited to your um, players' weddings. That's it. That's a hundred percent. And yeah. I forget the question, Vex. Maybe I, yeah. can't, I can't remember <laughs> what the question we asked him was, but he said basically, my goal as a coach is to get invited to as many weddings as possible of my players. And it just goes to how important relationship building is as a coach. And it's almost like that one kind of cliche saying like players will never remember what you say, but they'll remember how you made them feel kind of thing. And he's obviously had a lot of success in the game. So, you know, coming back and, and I learned a ton coming back, getting the uh, opportunity to coach with Shafe who I played for, um, seeing how the sausage was made and, and you get a whole new appreciation for people when you get to see behind the scenes and the amount of work and thought that goes into certain things. And then getting a chance to work with Benny too, um, you know, who obviously just got the head coaching job mm-hmm. at Princeton and we're so happy for him. Um, but like, what was it like coming in as a coach and, and you'd coached in junior, so you'd had a little bit of experience, but not in the college level. Yeah. What was it like to come in and, and learn from apps and, and what were some things that you took from him that you used in your own coaching? Yeah. So good question. Um, so I was, uh, three years as, as an assistant coach in the BCHL and then I got a head coaching job and was only there for one year. And then Seth hired me, um, a couple things in the college world, which I think is changing a little bit now with the extra coach, but, um, the recruiting, like it's, it's two jobs and, and <laughs> that was overwhelming, you know, like it's recruiting and then it's coaching. I mean, not even coaching, but it's like running the power play. It's two full-time jobs for it's sure. It's two full-time <laughs> jobs. I mean, like taking phone calls at 10 o'clock at night and, you know, being out for dinner with the wife and not missing a phone call from X player, or whatever, you know, it's just like, I got to get up and go outside. Yeah. Um, so like that was overwhelming. Um, from Seth, I mean, I think Seth's the same as us three. It's just, it's passion for the game. You know, it's, it's unwavered. Yeah. Do we have some hard times, but like there, you can't, fake passion. I mean, you just, you know, like it's just whether or not we got swept on the weekend, it's just they show up Monday with a great attitude and, you know, like just let's get better. Let's, let's fix things, you know? And I think maybe in junior, I, I know we had a really good year, the one year as a head coach, but I'd overreact and, um, you know, get vocal and maybe, you know, get on some kids where I think now if I was to go back, it'd be more of just a conversation. You know, like I think I don't want to be yelled at when I make a mistake now, you know, but if somebody just takes me aside, no matter how egregious the mistake was, someone just a coach, a mentor, a, you know, a, takes you aside and just talks to you and just, hey, this is, you know, what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to get at. I know you want to be a great teammate, but this is what we need from you now. Um, 
so and I think Seth was more that way than I was coming in. And I think I now lean more that way, definitely way more that way now. Yeah. And I think it, that's a part of where the game's gotten to as well. Yeah, for sure. And and I do have one great example of that that I wanted to bring up. Yeah. Um, so I do have the gold jersey on. <laughs> yeah, you do. Because he was playing right now. <laughs> so somebody who's befriended me, and we've I got a long story. We could talk forever on this. Yeah, but, let's go. Um, so Monty, Jim Montgomery, um, I actually took his job after he left RPI to go to Dubuque. So that's where Seth filled me in. And then Monty was recruiting at RPI a bunch of my players in Alberni in the BCHL. And we had a really good year. Um, I think we were 50 and 10 or something stupid. I don't know what it was. And the year before they were last. But Monty would come recruit our players. And then when he took the debut job and I was back at RPI, um, he would call me when he was entering the playoffs. He's like, hey, what'd you do here? So we've just always had that friendship. But to get to the story, I was fortunate enough to be able to, Monty invited me over to Vancouver um, to watch the Bruins play, not this year, but last year. We did go this year as well too, but last year. And obviously it was during their historic run. And this is where it goes to being genuine and honest and caring. Um, I got the opportunity with, Cam Neely and Sweeney and the assistants and Monty to break down the Kraken game on their day off, I believe, before the Vancouver game the next day. Anyways, I, I just, this hit me in the room. I was like, holy. So they acquired Orlov, um, I think the day before. And um, this was February something. But point being is they were on his, this historic run, you know, and they broke the record, as we all know. But Monty stopped, I know he won't mind me telling the story, but Monty stopped the video meeting in front of everybody and said, hey, guys, I just had this thought. We just acquired Orlov, and we haven't talked to our decor yet. He's like, I think I need to go grab these guys. They're all having, I think, lunch or whatever it was. And the whole staff was like, yeah, it, it's a great idea. So Monty left the video meeting and went and grabbed all the, must've been seven or eight on that trip, it was a West Coast trip for them, to let them know that th this isn't about you guys being not good enough, it's just about us as a team trying to get better, you know? Because they were, whatever they were at that time, 40 and 10 as well. Um, and I was like, wow, I mean, like, I never thought NHL coaches would actually act like that and just like be human about it. It's just like, yeah, it's part of the business. But to take the time during the three minute mark of the second period against the Kraken game, we're watching a video and he just gets up out of the room and goes and grabs the guys and has a meeting. I was like, I mean, that's the secret sauce. It's just, you know, it's just, yeah, we can be pro. We're getting all paid X amount of dollars. And we all know playing pro hockey and yeah, trades happen and whatnot, but to actually take the time and the thought during doing something else to actually care about what the defenseman on the trip to make sure that they're not worried about their jobs and make sure they're not worried about whatever, you know, just to be honest, you know, and I, th that, that really hit me. And it was a story I wanted to share. I just, cause it really, really hit me. I was like, wow. I mean, I never would have thought that would happen. Yeah. I thought, it was, thought it was a business. Man, every so everybody that I know that played for Monty, whether it was at Dubuque or Denver or any of the NHL stops that he's been at, like they've all been like, Yeah, I'll run through a brick wall for that guy. Not one person that I know that's played for him has not been in that capacity. And those are the kinds of stories of why. <laughs> like it's about people, man. And and it's all it's almost kind of funny in the way of like, hey, I'm stopping my hockey which is what we're, everybody thinks coaches are. It's just hockey people to go do a people thing and make sure that my people are good. My people and I are on the same page. The hockey can wait. Yeah. <laughs> the hockey's not that important. The people yeah. side, the relationship side is. Yeah. And it's such a great message to yeah. like, that's a great story, man. And yeah, I mean, my wins everywhere. It's not an accident, is it? I mean, yeah. 
you know, like it's at every level. And, and to follow up on that story quickly, so they were talking about, um, was it Grizzlick defending a rush as a smaller defenseman with one hand on a stick as opposed to he had two hands and they won with one. Point of the story being is that I went to the practice with Monty and then out of nowhere, I'm forgetting, is it Joe Sacco, the D-man coach? I believe he was, yeah. It still is, no? P- potentially, yeah. Yeah, anyways, I'm just a mutt. <laughs> I'm just hanging around, you know, with Monty. But one of their assistant coaches comes over with their uh, their their um, computer and actually shows me the clips that he's going to show Grizzly. Like, I'm just like, why are you showing me this? Like, He's like, yeah, it's just I know you're in the meeting and we were talking about this. And there's, it's the whole staff thing. It's the whole culture thing. It was just like whoever is a friend of this person is a friend of like, – it's just – I was really amazed and you know, I, yeah, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was that's people awesome, man. just be, be a good person, you know, and I don't think there's a secret recipe to it. It's just, you know, I don't well, know. The, the camaraderie within a coaching staff is so important. Like you have to enjoy the people that you're oh. going to work with every day. You have to have each other's backs. Like I'm, I've always been a big believer in like challenge in private and be on the same page in public. You know, you, you, you never want yes men, you know, and, and just somebody to agree with you on everything. There's got to be some challenging and there's got to be some new ideas brought and mm-hmm. banter and debate and things like that. But like, yeah, the, the camaraderie within a coaching staff is a really big deal. And I think the players can pick up on that too. Like if there's two coaches that don't like each other or don't agree on certain things and and working in college hockey and recruiting, like you, you know, that that's a thing in some places, like not everybody gets along and is on the same page. Um, hundred percent. And I think like when you have, when you foster as a head coach, I mean, at least at that level, when you foster an environment that, um, makes the assistants and even a trainer or equipment manager or anybody feel comfortable. It allows the assistants to maybe go home and put more thought into like, okay, if they're really going to listen to me, here's where, what I'm coming with. Like, here's what I really mean. I'm going to put more work in because I know it's going to be heard, you know, and it might not be go completely the way that I want it, but at least there's, you know, uh, a level of respect there. And when you get that level of respect, it makes me want to work harder. Going yeah, totally. back to my and point of not letting down my teammates. Yeah, it almost goes to what we were talking about earlier. Like when you can find a way to connect with people where you're doing things for them, you know, that's, I don't want to say your sole goal, but like that's a lot of what you bring to the table is you want to make other people, you know, successful and, and proud and, and things like that. Man, that's like that's a special sauce. I feel like in in a great culture is when it's it's about the we. Everything's about the we, and it's not about the me. And that's as cliche of a saying as there is out there. But and I also think like you learn from that because we've all probably been a part of teams or a part of cultures where it was like that, where it was like it was for the we, and everybody was kind of bought in and guys loved each other. And then we've been a part of teams where it's been the opposite almost where it was a little bit fragmented. There were clicks and like, there was a little bit more me in that. And like just the experience of going to the rink in those two opposite ends of the spectrum, like is so different, <laughs> right? It's so, so different. It's so, so different. It's oh. terrible. <laughs> so different yeah. practice is different workouts are different hanging out away from the rink is different everything oh. is different totally <laughs> um what do you what do you think nolan like yeah. you know you've been a part of some really successful spots you know you mentioned that y- your team in in uh in alberni before you came to rpi probably had that special sauce yeah like what do you what do you think's a bit of that recipe like what do you think is is the reason why some of those teams are like that and potentially some teams are not oh as far as my experience in alberni which i still keep in touch with all of those players and people um looking back on it i was vulnerable i i think i started out our and i can get some next players to verify this for me but I think I pretty much came in and they all knew I was a first year head coach. Um, And I think that's how I started the meeting. I am not going to be perfect. I don't expect you guys to be perfect. 
I'm going to make mistakes as are you, but like, this is, we're a team and you know, if we want to get to where we want to get to, we have to work together. And I guess I'll give you two examples that maybe some of your listeners might be able to relate to at, at least at that level. So one of the things I'm most proud of that year is that I made one trade and in junior hockey, that's a bit of a rarity, especially in 2009, yeah. 10. And I'll give you an interesting story about that trade. And I've heard a lot of positive comments five, 10, 15 years later about what happened with that. So I was a first year GM head coach and I traded player X, player Y to, to trail. It was trail for this one player. And <clears throat> I signed the paperwork first and I faxed it back to trail. We agreed to it on the phone. And um, I brought in the, sorry, I traded two players. Yeah, I brought in the one player first and I told him that we've traded him. Um, we needed to get better and I thanked him and, you know, he went and started packing his bag. And then I get a phone call from the trail coach and which I still talk to Jimmy. Um, and he said, my owner won't sign off on it. He's like, we need more. And I was like, like, Hey, I just told this one player and he's in tears right now. And so I hung up the phone and I'll try to make this quick. I hung up the phone and I called the player back in. And I said, Hey, this is on me. This is my bad. I, I signed the paperwork. I told you before I got the paperwork back and I apologize. I'm like, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. If you want me to keep you, if you want to go home until I find from Vancouver, this is on the Island. Um, if you want to go home until I find another place for you, I'm totally cool with that. And then he said to me, he's like, I love it here. I love what we're doing here. I want to stay here. And I went into the room and the guys already knew, like he was packing his bags. Like he told everybody he was traded. And um, I went in the room and I was like, guys, I know you guys know that I've traded player X. It was my mistake. I effed up. This is all on me. I gave this player the opportunity to go home or to go do whatever he wanted, or he can stay. And he's chosen to stay. And everybody erupted and was so happy. And then the captain came shortly after. He's like, I haven't, he's, who was 20 years old. Um, he's like, I have never had a coach explain something like that just so honestly. And I think that generated a lot of trust in me, you know, like I wasn't trying to be some BS or and just, you know, like it's just, it was my mess up and I take ownership for it. And, you know, and I think that helped galvanize it. And I'll give you a quick second story is that we, I got a word from a billet family that uh, this is later in the year and their best player um, was out late. And we all made the pact that, you know, no, being out past 10 o'clock, I think we had 10 games left and we wanted to win the, the league. And I got this call. So team meeting, called the player out. And um, I was like, me and our assistant coach will be on the ice. It's up to you guys. And I named our, our captains and assistants. And it's like up to you guys what you guys want to do. If you want to suspend them, because we all promised to not do this, then I'm on board. If you want them to miss five games, then great. If you want them to miss 10 games, then great. If you, whatever you guys decide as a group, then I'm on board. We and my assistant went out there and skated around for 15, 20 minutes and all the players came out. We had a meeting and all the players said that they accepted the apology from the player and that we want to just put this past us and just, you know, gave the group the responsibility or the, I guess, decision instead of just dictating what I think should happen. It was just, you know, and I, I don't know. I think those things add up to a community that cares about each other. Then we'll do that extra thing, you know, to ensure that the group is successful. That's awesome, man. That's yeah. so cool. And, and like, you know, I've, I've been fortunate with what I do now with the hockey think tank to be able to have these different kinds of conversations with so many different people of all levels of hockey, NHL, all the way down to Mike coaches, which is pretty interesting to get that perspective. Yeah. 
And like two of the things that you just said, I think are the hallmarks of like really special coaches. One is vulnerability, like really letting people in, getting people to know them. Like I remember watching, you know, Nick Saban, who's like, you know, the hardest coach that people see on TV, you know, with their, with his interviews and all that. But they did like, uh, I think it was called training days on ESPN where they chronicled Alabama football during their training camp. And one of the things he does every year is he makes sure that the entire team comes over to his house and sees him, not just as coach, but as grandpa and dad and interact with his grandkids and take the kids out on the tube and the boat and grill for him and all that kind of stuff. And, and just being open and vulnerable. And, and anytime yeah. that, that the players can see you as a human rather than just coach, mm-hmm. that's, that's a win. That's a huge win to connection. And when you connect with people more, you can hold them accountable better. Mm-hmm. You can be harder on them. Cause then they'll, again, going back to like, they'll yeah. run through a brick wall for you. Yeah. Um, and then the can other throw, thing, sorry, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, can I throw one thing at you in that? Yeah. Curious to know your thoughts, um, both your thoughts. I never let my players call me coach. <laughs> I despised it. I, they all call me whatever they wanted to call me. Nolan, NG, Grammar. I didn't want to be perceived as up above. And I, I, I don't, I'm not upset at anybody that is called coach. I think it's kind of a U.S. Canada thing, maybe a little bit. Um, for my coaches up here in Canada, it was always Harv and um, <laughs> whatever it was. It was just... But I didn't yeah. like that status. <laughs> Apps, yeah. I didn't like that status. I didn't want to be um, me, you know, sorry, uh, me me talking like I, I'm more important than you. I'm not. Yeah. I'm just a part of the team as well. So I, I love that. I also think, though, that part of that all depends on your personality and your coaching style. Obviously, if you're uh, if you're a, a Hastings type of coach, you're not having them just walk around and call you Mike. Hey, Mikey, you know that's that. That's a great, not great, happening. great point. Right? I bet like, you they call him Hasty. Maybe Hasto more behind. His back. <laughs> maybe, maybe behind his back. Um, but but his coaching style works. He wins yeah. games, you know, and, yeah. and makes players better. And I, I think a big part of that is all about who's in front of you. <laughs> How old are they? You know, what level are we talking about? And and also as a coach, what is your personality? Because I've also seen coaches go that way. And I'm more this way. I'm 100% more this way. A little way too far, you. maybe. <laughs> but I've seen coaches, hey, they're trying to be the buddy and, you know, they're going oh, out yeah, with yeah, team yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, whoa, pump the brakes, sir. Yeah. We don't, you know, so I, I also think yeah. that, they're, you know, it's a, a personality team. It's situationally driven. But I agree. Like, you know, if I had a coach like that and I did, you know, obviously in pro, it's way more like that than, than any other level I played at. And uh, it's definitely a different relationship. And I really enjoyed those relationships because I felt like there was a little bit more give and take versus I'm down here and you're up there and it's coming down at me no matter what I think or the team thinks or anybody, right? So I I love that. That's really cool. I think that's very important what you just said there too. I I, I 100% agree. Like it can't be fake. You know, it's just like, and that's fine. Like some people my wife's a teacher and she goes by Mrs. Graham, you know, and, and that's fine. Like, that's just, it, 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 but it can't be fake. You know, it's just gotta be genuine. I, I really love that word genuine just, and I think Dude, that's where you, you, you really need to know who you are as a person and what makes me thrive. Like it, it make, I love it when a player has success and they come back to the bench, like grammar, you see that? I'm like, yeah, love it. You know? Uh, as opposed to, you know, like coach, and that's just me. And again, I, I don't want to convolute or messy up the whole message, but I think that's, you need to know yourself, you know? Totally, man. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I have something as it relates to that, but I want to circle back really quick because I had two things for you. Um, you know, the first one, the, like things that a lot of special coaches do or have, you know, the first one we talked about vulnerability. And the second one is they really empower their team. And I think we can all agree that when the coach doesn't have to coach that much and, and the, the room is policed and I don't mean policed in a bad way, but the, the, the room is policed by the group. Um, 
and the issues are are fixed within the confines of the locker room and it doesn't have to be the coaches and there's a standard that is set by the players and the accountability to those standards are 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 set by by the players too and and executed on that's that's championship teams too like every championship team that I've been a part of we've had unbelievable buy-in through accountability of the group and not necessarily the accountability that's coming from the coaching staff. Yeah. And, and that's a really special thing. So I think like what you did there and empowering the group to, to make that decision. And like, I'm sure you empowered the group at the beginning of the year to be in, in, in setting the standards of what's acceptable and who we're going to be and what's our identity at the beginning of the year too. Like, you know, I feel like that's something that, um, I've seen and experienced really high level championship type teams is it's, it's the boys team. It's not yeah. the coaches team. It's the boys team. And, and, and us as coaches creating an environment where that's not only acceptable, but like encouraged, um, and you're developing leaders and you're putting them in situations where, Hey, they might fail. They might make the wrong decision, yeah. but to learn from it and get better from it. You know, yeah. um, I think that's a huge thing too. Hundred percent, totally agree. It's you know, it, it's not about me as a coach. It's about the team. You know, it's about the and, and I, I want to preface that also with like it's the whole group and you know, junior hockey is one thing. It's you know, in some in some sense, it's a small organization, but it comes down to like the ticker ticket takers and the you know the Zamboni drivers and it's like the people that you know call the game and it's everybody that jumps on the bus, like whether you're an equipment manager or I value everybody's opinion, you know, like we had an equipment manager that won a Stanley cup in um, New Jersey at RPI. I don't know if you know, Dana McGuain. Oh Anyways, yeah. Yeah. Everybody knows Dana. <laughs> everybody knows Dana. But like what he's a guy. watched, he's <laughs> he's watched more guy. hockey at more levels than me or Seth or at the time vines he ever did. It's so like sitting on the bus at the front after a loss. Like, Hey, what'd you see? Like, there's no wrong opinion. You know, it's like I, I, I've i seen or I heard this on the bench today. I didn't like that. It's just, it's everybody. I think it's empowering everybody, you know, like it, I think that's your job. At, and again, I, I don't have the experience of youth coaches, but I think you can take something out of that. Like it, yeah, like we're not going to let the Zamboni driver come on the ice and get off the Zamboni and push the nets. Like, no, it's, we're going to stay on the ice and help them out. Like it's, it's, it, it's a team, you know, Vex, yeah. I know you got something to add there. That's like your favorite <laughs> thing to talk about. I mean, get more, be more, baby. Get everybody on the bus, you know, get everybody. How can we incorporate everybody? How can everyone, and you know, I, 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 I don't ever want to sound like a uh, hippie or soft or anything like that, you know, because hey, well, I, I got a, I got a ponytail. So. <laughs> <laughs> talking the right guy, yeah. talking the right guy. Right. But like, but because I think that when some people hear people like us who kind of view relationships from a coaching to player standpoint, or, or if you're running an organization standpoint, I think some old school guys might think like we're talking about like being soft and it's like, no, you're still holding people responsible. You're still, you know, coaching, you're still doing all these things, but like making people understand and realize that whatever their role is, is important, makes them want to excel at that role, you know? And, and then when you have everyone excelling at their roles together, now it's this massive juggernaut where everybody's going in the right direction. And, you know, Newton said an object in motion will stay in motion. Let's keep this thing rolling. And, and the more people we get, yeah, part of it, it's going to be bigger and harder to stop, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And and again, when you foster that environment, maybe I get the Zamboni driver coming to me one day saying, hey, this kid, you know, just shot pucks at when I told him to get off the ice or whatever. And it's like, okay, you know, like, let's nip that in the bud right away, you know? And it just makes everybody, again, that equipment manager is equally as important as the Zamboni driver as I am as the third string goalie. You know, right. Right. Totally, playing. Yeah. totally, totally. Well, before we let you go, Nolan, I, I have to imagine when this podcast comes out next week, you know, there's going to be a lot of guys in college hockey that are going to be pumped 
like so pumped to, to hear from you. So pumped to see how you're doing. And so a couple questions I have for you is, you know, number one, how's life right now? Like, how's everything going? You're back home. You got your wife, you got your daughter. Um, and I think people would love to hear kind of just, just how Nolan's doing right now. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, perspective is a thing that Vex and I talk about consistently, constantly on our podcast and getting the chance to take a step back from whatever it is that you're doing, um, to, to see maybe a little bit of the bigger picture, get a little bit more of a 10,000 foot view of life in general, you know, and, and, you know, you had a, a traumatic accident, uh, tragic one that kind of forced you to have to do that. Um, and you know, we've, we've communicated and texted for, for a lot, like since then. And, and, um, I, I'd love to know from you too, like just kind of just perspective, man, just perspective on life and, and things like that. So yeah. first of all, kind of just, if you can't just fill everybody in how, yeah. how you're doing and, and what you got up your sleeve and, and what you got going on right now. And then if we can talk a little bit about just, just perspective a little yeah. bit, I think that would be awesome too. Yeah. So, um, for your listeners that don't know, um, on March 6, 2018 at 4th or 534, I was at the Rite Aid with my nephew. Um, and nobody really knows this story. Nobody knows the story. Um, a half a mile from our house, I went down the street and went to a Rite Aid to get uh, seltzer water to celebrate our daughter's birthday. We were on the road in Colgate. Uh, where we lost in the playoffs during her actual birthday on March 3rd. So we had a birthday party um, at uh, my house right by the rink. And um, so my daughter wanted to come. She was three at the time, but she, <laughs> she peed her car seat. So the car seat wasn't in the car. So these are all things that, so my nephew came who was nine years old and lives on Vancouver Island. So we just went to the Rite Aid, went and got 12 pack of seltzer water, came out of the parking lot at 5.30, and an elderly woman pushed the wrong pedal um, and gassed it. And according to the police report and witnesses, I pushed my, my nephew out of the way, which I don't remember ever doing, and was hit by an SUV and then the elderly woman didn't thought she hit a shopping cart according to her statement and backed up over me again and the only point of contact was my head so I woke up four days later in the ICU five days later I don't know what it was um, with four skull fractures ear to ear and uh, numerous brain hemorrhaging and paralyzed on my left hand side because all my injuries were on the right. Um, so, you know, to go through that, I was in the hospital for two, two three months and, um, you know, been told by many doctors or by every doctor that I can't um, return to my profession um, of coaching hockey. And, um, I mean, brain injury is a tough thing. It's... Uh, I know, and I'm saying this because I've always wanted to go back and write to every GoFundMe donator um, who ever donated, and I've never shared this story, but it's hard. It's um, the brain's a hard thing. It's um, as I'm learning, it's a very unknown thing um, still to this day. I mean, a lot of practitioners claim they can help things, and there is some stuff that can be done, but unfortunately, with major trauma. Um, like a, a lemon-sized dead le lesion in my head, it affects certain things. And um, so I, anyway, I, I want to say thank you to all the people that continue to message and, you know, care. Um, so that, 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 that happened in 2018, and I denied it. And I've had doctors ask me, like, are you fighting this or are you accepting what happened? I fought it forever. I, it's it, it, it's one thing when you know what happened, but when you don't know what happened, it's just like I fought with every nurse. And then my wife was like, this is not him. And that's a very common thing with brain trauma. 
Um, but I, I guess to, there's a middle midline um, in your brain that separates your right and left, left hemisphere. And my injury is on the right. And it was swelling up and pushing my, 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 my brain into the left-hand side. And if it didn't stop, then they were going to have to cut a piece off of my, to let the hemorrhaging happen. Um, but, um, and this is where another part of the story is <laughs> Tof. Everyone always made fun of my running because I really got into running. Um, Vex, my, we would be like out recruiting somewhere and we'd see Nolan like coming in at like 8 a.m. We'd be like, hey, what? he'd be like, yeah, I just ran like 78 miles. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he's just always running. Well, it was awesome. I did the Boston Marathon five times in a row. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Unreal. So part of that, and I, I, it's been long enough. I've been angry enough that I can make fun of it now. Um, uh, um, I was going to say, um, my fitness helped me. So the, the amount of inflammation in my body was so minimal because I was so fit. And uh, they actually got to the point maybe week two where they had to come take the heart rate monitor off of me because my heart rate was actually going back down to like resting level, which I think at the time was like 39, 41. And that was like, you're, should be dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wow. like, no, yeah, like I wow. was taking my heart rate, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so I went through all that and I mean, what's life look, life look like now is um, I've had many people say what I lost in my career and, you know, um, Toph, like how much time you spend away from your family. Um, yeah. I've gained all that. I've gained all my time with my, my girls, you know, like I used to be on the road. Let's just say, I think my Marriott's still at like 700 Marriott nights uh, <laughs> total, you know, like it's just ridiculous, whatever it was. But um, I get to spend that time with um, my family and they've seen me through a lot of tears, a lot of, you know, being upset and being frustrated and, you know, I'm, so what, what does my day to day look like? I'm a stay at home dad. I get to make lunch in the morning. I get to make my wife's uh, lunch for uh, school and, you know, um, drive and pick them up and come home and not miss a gymnastics class or not miss a, a school piano recital. And so perspective, that's what I've gained. You know, I've lost a lot of my passion. Like, you know, I think I've, I've I, I, I text myself a lot when I have random thoughts, but like, if you could work, if you can make your passion or your hobby, your, your job, for one, what would that be? And then if you could make, what's the amount of money you need to be happy? If you could make all that, well, I had all that. And then it was just gone. And um, to find a different, I guess, purpose, you know, and I guess my purpose is my family. Um, but there's still hard times where, you know, the girls are at school and, you know, it's a holiday in the U.S. and I get to watch a two o'clock hockey game. It's like, you know, I miss it every day. You know, I miss it every single day and I fill my time with, you know, watching the playoffs right now and unfortunately i go to bed at about eight o'clock and i well fortunately <laughs> i live on the west coast I was so gonna say, that's good yeah. so far west so, <laughs> <laughs> so you guys get to watch the 10 o'clock games out here but um I, I go to my brain injury society meetings i still see doctors i i do silly exercises that you know, I still have no feeling in my left side of my shoulder and down. I've done physio and seen physiatrists about that. But essentially, your brain, from what I've learned, is a it's a computer, for one. But it's like pulling out one chunk of the computer. You don't know what it's going to do, but one chunk is gone. It's still visible on MRIs, and um, it always will be. And I don't believe after five, six years that my feeling in my left hand will come back, but, or it, it hasn't. And I mean, 
as far as I don't know how much people really want to know, but more emotional than I've ever been. I'll say in the 25 years before, I maybe cried at a funeral, um, but I've never sat on a couch and just cried because I miss being a part of a team. Um, and uh, I miss going to the rink, you know, like my balance isn't great, um, like vestibular stuff. Um, my spatial awareness isn't great. So like the best way I describe it is like close one eye and try to, you know, grab something and then touch your nose. Like it's just off and um, it's just something you deal with. And but through brain, I'm very grateful to be here. I was told, and you can look it up. Um, I think it's 69% of people don't make it. Um, of that, a lot of people, and I see it at the Brain Injury Society, a lot of people are somewhat paralyzed. Um, they do have part of their skull removed. It's just, I'm fortunate, I'm grateful, and, you know, every day is a privilege, really, because, like, I never, I can't, you just talked about Tove, like, I run, I run the streets of Troy, New York all the time, and I'm very aware of vehicles, and I never saw this one coming. Mm. Like I just never in a million years saw it coming. It just, you know, it, it's wild, you know, it's, it's life. And yeah, there are times where I feel sad and that was the right word. Um, like just, I don't want to say helpless, but, um, um, I feel sorry for myself sometimes. Yeah. And uh, why did this happen? But um, on the grand scheme of things, you know, like it's a privilege to be alive, you know? And I think when I am able to do something, I, like, I think you guys talk about this quite a bit, but I think for maybe young hockey players or even coaches, for one, be present in whatever you're doing. Like, I put my phone away now, like when I'm with my daughter and she's playing the piano, like I'm not checking whatever. I just be present to what you're doing. And then whenever you're able to do something like, and this is for young players, do it with a purpose. Like what's your purpose? And I think Vex, you say intention a lot. Like wh why are you doing this? Like why are you shooting pucks right now? Like it's one thing to go out there and just, you know, kind of half ass it a bit but like do it with a purpose. And yeah, there are times to have fun and do stuff, but when it's time to do work, like do work, you know? And, and, and I think too, going back full circle with talking about coaching, I, I feel like it's, and I, again, had this down, um, be well-rounded as a, as a, as a, as a person, even as a coach, you know, I think a lot of coaches and hockey players define themselves as a hockey player or define themselves as a coach. I'm a coach. Well, what what else are you? Like, I'm a dad. You know, I'm a husband. I'm, you know, I love my cats. You know, they came, it was pouring rain here this morning, and I take time to actually wipe them down. And <laughs> maybe beforehand, I would have just, that's it's a cat being a cat. I got to go to practice. You know, like, it's just, <laughs> there's more to life than just sport. And I think that's where I think your podcast for me at least really hits home is be a well-rounded individual. And, you know, we want to create, I don't say create, but we want to coach life skills. You know, we want to, and those are things that maybe I, not maybe, those are things that I didn't really do, or I didn't have the, you know, the 3000 foot, 30,000 foot view of, if I was a coach now, like maybe I would, as a head coach, there's more time for family time. As a coach, maybe I would tell my players, you know what, tonight, guys, everybody's going home and at five o'clock, you're calling your mom. You know, like more just that sort of stuff, you know, and to, because we all get caught up in our own stuff. And when you're removed from it and you sit and you kind of look on the outside and you're like, yeah, I get tears and I'm, I'll go upstairs and see what the score of the Bruins game is. And I'll tell, yeah, 
but like there's more to it it's just it's life amen man i uh and i think a lot of people like the three of us on this call and and a lot of people in our industry struggle with that you know we're 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 all in man like we're committed we want to win <laughs> we're competitive we care um and and sometimes that can be a really good thing and and sometimes that can hold us back because you know, having a little bit of more well-roundedness, like you said, can help us be better at what we do by taking a step back. And I always said that like us as coaches, like we're really good at grinding, we're really good at grinding. That's, that's a, that's one of the best compliments you can ever give one of us is man, that guy works, man, that guy grinds. Um, and, 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 and you have to, to be successful, but you also have to have that well-roundedness too. And I think a lot of us learn that in, the hard way, <laughs> you know, in, in our personal lives. And, and, uh, then we got to find a way to change and, and figure it out and stuff. But man, I think that's, that's such good perspective to, to give to everybody. It's such a great lesson is like, Hey man, like, even though this is our passion, even though this is everything that we want, we still have, and like shit we had, I don't even, I don't know if you know, Duncan Fletcher, um, but Duncan works for the PA Benny, um, mm -hmm knew him really well. And, and, and so I got to know him and he was on the podcast before and, you know, they did like these studies that like having other interests actually led to better performance in sports. Like those are studies that have been done and, and being so narrowly focused as much as we see that as a good thing. And as much as at times it could be a good thing, we also got to zoom out sometimes too. And so, yeah, man, that's, that's great yeah. advice. And, and the, the last thing I'll leave you with here is, um, I, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned him a little bit earlier, but one of your best buddies hmm. is killing it right now at the yeah. university of Maine. Um, <laughs> you know, just, uh, yeah, our, our, our Cornell guys got him in the tournament, but I know, um, you know what he's done with that program and, and I know how tight you guys are yeah. and, and this fraternity that we have in college hockey is, is something that's, that's really, really special. Yeah. You know, talk, talk a little bit about how proud yeah. you are of, of Benny up there in in Maine and, uh, and, and just seeing <laughs> him and what he's been able to accomplish as, uh, as a former teammate of yours. <sighs> he's been the same since day one. So we need, when I say know yourself to be a successful coach, he was the same way as a freshman. So I was a sophomore when he was a freshman. And then, yeah, like he, he's genuine, you know, like he wears his heart on his sleeve and, you know, I, I'm like super proud. Am I shocked? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, to, I, I'm sure Benny's fine with me saying this and, like I talk to him too sometimes and he appreciates my perspective on what he's done. Like he, he's a winner. He wants to win. And I'm like, Penny, like you gotta like, relax a little bit. Like look where he came from a couple of years ago. Like, you know, like it's, it's a process, you know, it's, it's going to take some time. And, and I know he appreciates that too. It's just to have that someone to say, Hey, you know, yeah, okay. You lost to be you or whoever it was, but like, in the grand scheme of things, you should be super proud of like your kids. And I know he is like your kids, your players, but I know, I know he is, but he, he, he's awesome. Yeah. Like it's, um, it's phenomenal. I'm, I'm super excited for all my previous colleagues that are crushing it. And, and I guess, you know, related to Benny as well too. Um, and this goes for, I know you too. Um, Kirk McDonald, I know he's had a guest and oh yeah. Um Monty. Um but I have all the respect in the world for what our spouses have gone through as well. Hmm. And I think that's something that's not talked about a lot. Um, we follow our dreams of coaching, and maybe the next best opportunity is 500 miles away. Um and our wives pick up and pack up and take care of the kids and move on. And my wife has seen me over the last five, six years in my absolute worst. Could she have left? For sure. Would she have reason? Would I be mad at her? Probably not. I know how I've been. Um, and uh, I know how Benny's wife has traveled. I think she was, well, definitely UMass, but I think she, well, she was in Western. <laughs> 
Um, you know, Monty's wife has been Dubuque, Denver, Dallas, St. Louis. Like it's just, you know, I think that's something that's not spoken about a lot. And that goes for the, the, the female coaches out there as well, too. Like it's, I understand the commitment that it takes to be a coach, but I think sometimes often overlooked and not spoken enough enough about is the the love and uh, you know um, 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 just what or what our wives go through and the amount of support that they they give us or spouses. Yeah, totally, man. That's so yeah. true. One of the things I remember. Um, so actually, so Ray Sawada, who you. Yeah. No. Um, you know, I remember when he was playing in, uh, in Texas, he was playing in Austin for the AHL Dallas's AHL team and they were in playoffs and their head coach, uh, right before playoffs sent flowers to every single girlfriend or wife on the team and was just like, thank you. You know, like, thank you for basically putting up with our BS, <laughs> you know, and, and, and for my BS and, you know, things like that. And it's so true, man. Like it takes a village, cool. it takes a village and you have to have the right partner in this business to, um, not only succeed, but, you know, be fulfilled with what you do, um, mm -hmm. the sacrifice that they have to make for mm -hmm. us to follow our dreams and, and vice versa. You know, we, we try as best as we can to do that for them too, yeah. with, with their dreams. Yeah. Um, but man, it is, it is a, a, a profession, a business where oh. it takes everybody, man. Yeah. It, you're, you're so right. I mean, as a player, as a coach, you lose a game, you have a bad game, you have a bad streak of four games. Like you come home, you're not a, pumped. You're not in a great mood to sit down and watch a movie with the, the lady. It was the same as a player. It was the same exactly. As a player. Mm -hmm. I had a bad game. I was like, I I know that I wasn't the happiest person to be around. Unfortunately. No, <laughs> you know. And I think that's where again, like, and this is coming from six years out of it. Like, just be present. You know, I know that's hard. I get it. You know, the the, the elite of the elite are, I don't say perfectionists, but we expect a lot of it of ourselves, and we can't when we don't produce or reach the level that 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 that, that we want to. We it's hard not to take it home, but like, again, being present, it's a special skill. You know, if you can just remind yourself once in a while, and maybe it's, you come home and you don't drop the F bomb so much and you kind of just, you know, <laughs> crack a little smile or something. And just, I think you'd be surprised how much that helps. Yeah. Well, you, you said something about um, eight to nine minutes ago, I think when you said, what do my days look like now? Yeah. I get to make my daughter's breakfast. I get to drive my daughter's to school. And I think that anybody, ha honestly, anybody who has anything tough, hard, bad, horrific happen to them, you also said the word perspective. I think there's nothing that could be more important to find that perspective and to really be conscientious of the words that you speak to yourself mainly and also to others because you easily could have said i have to i have to but you get to you get to be here you survived that you 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 wouldn't be with your daughters or your wife or anyone you get to do that no matter what you go through in a day you get to do that and uh you know i think I had I, I had a lot of concussions, one that ruined my career right when it started. I'm not comparing it to what you've no. been through at all, but I know that, you know, people always ask me, like, how hard is it for you, and why don't you go watch games, and why don't you play anymore, and it's because it's way too hard for me. And uh, thing, saying things like I get to and being present and practicing gratitude and all of those things are something that really helped me, um, you know, with those – tough times that inevitably come when I, when I do let myself think about that type of stuff as well. So I, I really, really wanted to point that out because no matter what you're going through, you know, it always could be worse and perspective like Tof and I always talk about on this podcast and you talked about so eloquently is the only thing I think that could possibly get you to flip your mindset that quickly from not poor me, but wallowing in your sorrows and and obviously there is a time for that but at the same time if you allow yourself to sit there it's never going to go anywhere you want it to so finding you know your purpose like you said and 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 your 
things like that. I think it couldn't be more important. And I'm happy you're here, man. And I'm happy you're on this podcast. I appreciate you saying that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Um, before we let you go, um, one of the smartest hockey guys I know, oh, come one on. most passionate hockey guys I know, and we get a lot of kids that listen to this on the way to the rink. Um, what's some advice you have for a young kid that has goals and aspirations? You know, we talked a little bit earlier about the the joys of playing college hockey, um, getting the chance to coach at our alma mater. How how special of a uh, you know, an opportunity that is, and there's a lot of kids listening that potentially have that dream too. So what's, what's one piece of advice you would give to a younger kid that wants to play at that level? If you really, really, really want to get to that level, you can. And I know it's just that it's cliche and everything, but it's the, it's the, it's the honest truth. Um, you have to want it though. It's not something that somebody can give you personally. I don't think it's something a coach can give you. I think it's intrinsically in you. If you want to do it, then you will show up at the gym, be present, work out with a purpose. And again, there's times to have fun. It doesn't have to be all serious all the time. There's like, I, I, I can tell you right now that there's guys playing in the NHL and the playoffs right now, they're still having fun. They're having fun. If they weren't having fun, they wouldn't probably be doing it. Um, but if you want to, whatever you want to do, you can do it. And I know people say that, and I didn't really believe that. And again, I'm coming from a guy that, I'm a guy that my dad cut me when I was in Phantom AAA. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I've seen it at all levels, and you see it at, I mean, look at John Cooper, never played hockey. You know, like he just wanted to be a hockey coach. And, um, you know, like it's, you can get out of life whatever you want to get out of life. I really, I really believe that. And if, you know, I don't know if that's going to resonate with a lot of your younger listeners, um, but it's uh, it's the honest truth. You know, it's, um, there's things that I've done in my life and, that I never, ever, ever would have thought that I would do, but um, something in me just had the fire going, and, you know, I was never, nobody ever told me to go run. <laughs> so, I just, just, I just loved wanted it. to do it. I just loved it. Yeah. yeah. You know what I actually liked? And maybe uh, quickly, I know you want to wrap up here, but. No, um, it's all good, man. The, the, the best thing for me for running was, is the most simplest form of you get out of it what you put into it. Like mm. that you don't, it's the very most simplest form. It's like if you really want to get faster, it, you got to do some speed work, you know? And it's just like if you don't want to do speed work, you're not going to get faster. It's just like for me, it was a, I don't want to say you don't want to rely on teammates because you don't. It's just a self thing, but it was a very simple way of just seeing just improvements, just. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Random I'm, thought. <laughs> I'm telling you, Vex, like, dude, we'd be like recruiting out in British Columbia, out in Western Canada or something. And we'd like, maybe it was like a showcase or something like that. And the first game started at 9 a.m. Like, Nolan would come in and we'd be like, how many miles you run so far today? Yeah, and be like, 20 <laughs> or something like we'd be like home and and it was, it's 9 a.m everybody else is rolling out of bed you know just just coming off of breakfast and coffee and things and and no it's like yep yeah, I'm, I'm 20 miles deep right now so yeah it was awesome yeah <laughs> well no thank you so much man for coming on this this was one of my favorite episodes we've ever done and and we appreciate you coming on and and sharing your wisdom because you are an, an awesome hockey guy but but also telling your story and and providing your perspective and stuff i think so many people are going to get so much out of both of those things and and uh love you man and i uh, can't wait to get out to to western canada again at at some point to to see uh uh, in person, not over this, this computer thing that we got here. Um, but uh, well, you guys are both welcome to crash anytime. We have a place in Nanaimo for you. Vax, you ever been to Vancouver Island? I have not. I do need oh. to get out there. Cause Dave Krisky's out there. One of my former teammates. So what city is he in? 
I don't know, Vancouver or something. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> Dude, I'm not. Don't test me out. Old Canadian. jacket, green jacket, yeah. who gives? You're not, the out, ge- you're not the geography guy, hey? No, definitely not Canadian geography. U.S. geography, pretty good. Uh, yeah. Canadian geography, I would get an F- minus for sure. Speaking <laughs> speaking of U.S. geography, it was yeah. always so funny. So, M, my wife, is from Jersey. And huh? to everybody on the East Coast, there's like New Jersey, New York. Then there's like a bunch of states. And then there's California. Like, <laughs> you know, there's like nothing like so who true. knows what's going on past like <laughs> New York. And uh, uh, oh, God. Uh, anyways, dude, thank you so much. This was awesome. And uh, we really appreciate your time, man. Guys, I really appreciate you guys having me. It honestly, it means more than uh, you guys possibly know. I love talking hockey and um, I'm grateful that. Um, you guys are the first person to talk to um, in many years. So awesome. awesome dude. Thank you, you guys. Awesome, it's like therapy for me today. So thank Woo. you.